Well, good morning, everyone. I invite you to be seated. Good morning from St. Bart's in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Peter Thompson. I serve as the vicar here, and whether you're here joining us in person or joining us online, it is my honor and my delight to welcome you to the forum where each week we hold sacred conversations about the things that matter. Today we are honored to be joined by the Reverend Dr. Randall Balmer. He is the John Phillips Professor in Religion at Dartmouth College. Uh, this is uh, one of several visits he's made to St. Bart's, either uh, uh, in person or online. Um, I think your first visit was several decades ago in the days of Bill Tully, um, but he also joined us a few times online virtually uh, during the pandemic, which was, which was excellent. Today he's going to be talking about his new book, Passion Plays, How Religion Shapes Sports in North America. It's available in our bookstore along with several of his other books, so uh, if you don't yet have it, please check it out after the forum today. Professor Balmer, thanks so much for coming back to St. Bart's. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's always good to be here. Thank you for coming, and thank you for the invitation. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to talk about the new book. It's a stunning new book called Passionate Plays. <laughs> and this is a book that actually has deep origins. Uh, when I was in graduate school at Princeton in the early 1980s, one of my mentors was uh, really a colonial historian named John Murren. And I often describe him as having forgotten more about colonial history than most of the rest of us will ever know. And sadly, John passed away a couple of years ago from, uh, from COVID. But his real passion was sports. And he would talk about sports, particularly baseball, basketball, and football. And he would talk about sort of the symbolic meaning behind each sport. And so it's really true that I've been thinking about this book for 40 years before I finally got around to writing this book. And it was really inspired by John and his uh, passion for sports. And he helped me to understand it, I think, a little bit better. And I'd like to think that I've uh, added a little bit to what he had to say over the years. But uh, in many ways, he was the inspiration. The more recent inspiration for the book was my discovery of sports radio here in New York when I was teaching at Columbia in the early 1990s. And I just couldn't believe that sports talk hosts could sustain a conversation for hours about whether or not Joe Torre should have lifted the starting pitcher with two outs in the bottom of the sixth inning. And that's to me was a great mystery, but I have to say I got sucked into it. I certainly became uh, addicted myself. So in many ways, this book was, is trying to understand the, the passion surrounding sports. And one of the things I'm, I'm trying to argue, I think, and it's uh, a bit sad, I have to say, but I think the real passion for a lot of Americans have mo has moved from the sanctuary to the stadium. This is where people are really invested. And I, I say that not with uh, any satisfaction, <laughs> believe me. But I think that's, uh, and there are a number of reasons for that, which I hope we'll have time to get into. So uh, let's get started here. Uh, that's not the way to get started, is it? Uh, so I have to, let's try this. No, that's not going to work either. Well, maybe this is not going to work. Um, I put this together just to try to, to give me some structure in talking about this. But one of the backgrounds for understanding the emergence of the four major team sports in North America is a movement that began really in Britain and came over across the Atlantic in the 19th century called muscular Christianity. And it grew out of concern that men were becoming too uh, effeminate. At the same time, men were not showing up in the churches the way they had in previous decades. And so a group of uh, Anglican clergymen got together and really devised this notion of muscular Christianity. That is to combine Christianity with the metaphors of militarism and athleticism that we find in the New Testament, particularly in the writings of Paul. Paul talks about running the, the race, finishing the course, also putting on the full armor of God. And so this muscular Christianity movement took a lot of institutional forms. Uh, boys brigades, for example, was begun in Scotland late in the 19th century. Uh, probably the best known uh, in terms of militarism would be the Salvation Army. Again, this sort of muscular Christianity. And in terms of athleticism, you 
you had, again, a number of institutions. Uh, probably the, mo the best known would be the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, that was begun in 1844 by George Williams in order to try provide a space for young men coming into the cities during the Industrial Revolution so that they could uh, have a place to, uh, have, to nurture both their faith and also provide recreation to keep them off the streets, frankly, is what they wanted to do in the 19th century. The notion of muscular Christianity has had several iterations since then. Uh, you think about uh, organizations like uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Athletes in Action, Power Team from, for Christ. Here we go, thank you, Peter. Uh, and most recently, Promise Keepers. Some of you remember that from the 1990s, this huge movement that was begun by a football coach at the University of Colorado, and they had their, their huge gatherings, men only, in sports stadiums. This would be the most recent example of muscular Christianity. But muscular Christianity also fueled the emergence of each of these four major team sports. And so let's talk about uh, each one of them uh, in, in turn. Uh, here are the four major team sports, and I'm sorry, I forgot, <laughs> I had this here. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by the circumstance that the four major team sports in North America really can be charted along a geographical arc that begins in Princeton, New Jersey, goes up to New Brunswick, New York City, up into Connecticut at Yale in particular, and then all the way up to Montreal. This is the geographical arc where these four major team sports emerged and developed. And even the other developments are not that far out of that arc. So you have this sort of geographical location for each of these four major team sports. Let's start with baseball. It's not a sport, it's a religion. It takes on new beliefs with the greatest of reluctance. There's. <laughs> a mythology surrounding baseball that you probably heard about, which is called the Cooperstown myth, that Abner Doubleday on a beautiful summer day in 1839 sat in front of Cooper's tailor shop in Cooperstown, New York, and mapped out this new game of baseball. And then it was played shortly thereafter in Elihu Finney's cow pasture, and thus began the game of baseball. It's a great story utter fiction. Abner Doubleday actually was a cadet at West Point when he supposedly <laughs> invented the game of baseball. And in fact, in his 70 plus years, he never claimed credit for inventing baseball. Baseball really it, uh, evolved out of uh, several British games, as well as a Dutch game called stoolball, rounders back in, in uh, England, also cr cricket. But there was a great deal of emphasis early in the history of baseball to assert that it was an American game. It did not have British origins. So uh, A.G. Spalding of the Spalding Sporting Goods Empire, uh, put together a commission called the Mills Commission, led by A.G. Mills, and they were looking for the real origins of baseball, and they decided, on, uh, despite the fact that there was no corroborating evidence, that the Cooperstown myth would be the, the way you would understand baseball. Actually, the earliest I indication we have of baseball being played in uh, the United States is in uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts in 1790. So that predated the Cooperstown myth by uh, a great deal of, uh, of time. What I find striking about baseball it is, is that it is the quintessential immigrant game. That is, despite the fact that A.G. Mills and A.G. Spaulding wanted to assert the American origins of baseball, it's really the quintessential immigrant game. It's the only game where the defense controls the ball. And it is the object of the offensive player, the batter, to disrupt the defense's control of the ball. He's outnumbered nine to one. If he fails seven times out of 10, if he fails seven times out of 10, he'll go to the Hall of Fame. That's how difficult it is. And that is a, an image of how immigrants came to this country. They're facing this hostile territory. There are only three islands of safety. 
out there in that hostile world. And of course, the greatest triumph is to return home. The other element of baseball, it's not so much religious, but I want to put, throw this in as well, is that baseball really is developed during the Industrial Revolution. But baseball alone among the major team sports rejects the icon of industrialism, which is the clock. Even the base runner circling the bases does so counterclockwise, as though he's trying to subvert the passage of time. So baseball is very much countercultural during the American Revolution. Uh, you think about the cities. Uh, there's one right here, right outside our door. Uh, the concrete canyons. But you look for various islands of grass and greenness in, in, in the city, and they are parks, very often baseball fields, because baseball is trying to stand against the Industrial Revolution. And that's, I think, why in part the uh, Cooperstown myth took hold for a long time, because it celebrates these sort of rural sylvan values in America that were quickly disappearing with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. This is one of my favorite photographs, uh, which I, I, I put in the book, uh, to show that outsiders have always excelled at baseball. Uh, immigrants in the 19th century would be from Germany or from uh, Italy, from uh, Scandinavia, perhaps. More recently, of course, you had Jackie Robinson on the left breaking the color barrier in, 18, in 1947. And uh, more recently, we have players from the Caribbean, particularly the Dominican Republic, and now more and more Asian players are playing baseball. So it really is an immigrant game in many ways. I love this photograph because you have Jackie Robinson of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Sid Gordon of the New York Giants, and Joe DiMaggio of the New York Yankees. All of them would be considered outsiders, but yet they are playing and excelling at the game of baseball, the quintessential immigrant game. Let's move on to football. Some of you remember Howard Cosell. After all, is football a game or a religion? That's a good question. Uh, football really emerged in the years after the Civil War. The first intercollegiate football game was played in New Brunswick, New Jersey in 1869, four years after the end of the Civil War. And it was played by, initially by the sons brothers and nephews of Union Army soldiers in elite Northeastern universities. Princeton, Rutgers, Columbia, Yale, eventually Harvard, and other places. And football is the quintessential military game because it has to do with the conquest and the defense of territory. Just like the battlefields at Gettysburg, Antietam, Bull Run, wherever else you want to chart in the, in the, 19, in the Civil War. Uh, in, the, in, in the course of writing the book, it came, with, came up with all sorts of rhetoric, military rhetoric, to describe football, to describe football as war. And in fact, in its early years, it was really quite brutal. I haven't run across yet a 19th century reference to a football game that didn't use the word brutality in the, in the description of the game. Uh, it was a very dangerous game in part because, of course, you didn't have the sort of protective gear that you had in, uh, that you have now. Uh, one of the real developments in football was from Walter Camp, who in many cases is regarded as the father of American football. And he wanted to replace the rugby scrum with a line of scrimmage. So you have the battle lines drawn after every play where the teams go back and, and confer with each other, come back and face each other around, across this line of scrimmage, and then, of course, uh, uh, run into each other with a, with a great deal of force, which is uh, part of the game of football. It's the only game that's, uh, where violence is really scripted into the game. You have violent eruptions in hockey, of course, but in football, it's part of the game itself, and that, that I think, uh, attests to its military character. One of the interesting things about football, I think, and I write in the book, that football, in order to attain its sort of universal approbation today, it is, uh, by most measures, the most popular American sport, it, it had to overcome what I call the three R's. That is region, religion, and race. Football, again, was devised in the Northeast, but it really didn't become popular until it began to 
permeate the South. And one of the reasons that football is so popular in the South is because the South is really a military culture. If you look at the levels of enlistment in the armed forces uh, regionally, the South far outstrips the rest of the country in terms of military service and military enlistment. But football also had to address the issue of religion because it was played, it was devised by Protestants at Northeastern elite schools. And so when Catholic institutions, Boston College, Fordham University, and of course the University of Notre Dame, began playing football in the early decades of the 20th century, they began to excel. And so Catholics took a great deal of satisfaction that they, Catholics, were beating the Protestants at their own game. And you know what, uh, you know how important uh, Football is at the University of Notre Dame, for example, especially with Touchdown Jesus on the, on the, the mosaic on the side of the uh, Theodore Hesburg Library in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, football is very important, but football, along with other sports, is a way for individuals similar to the, to the immigrants with baseball to kind of make their place, assert their standing in American society. So for example, uh, there are early accounts of Mormons playing baseball out in Utah shortly after the Great Migration in 1847. And they're doing that because they want to assert, we are American, we are part of American society, part of the fabric of American society. We've already talked about immigrants, but also Catholics with football. Uh, Jews with baseball in particular, taking a great deal of vicarious satisfaction in somebody like Hank Greenberg playing for the Detroit Tigers, or more recently, Sandy Koufax. Uh, and this was a way for Jews to say, yes, we are American too, because we can play your game and we can excel at, at these games. The final R, of course, was race, and that was a troubled story. And in the course of researching the book, I found all sorts of very difficult um, narratives about how football was desegregated. In some ways, it was the first major sport to desegregate at the professional level when the American Football Association was, uh, was founded in 1920, the immediate precursor to the NFL, the National Football League. Jim Thorpe, Native American, was president of that organization. And uh, Fritz Pollard was an, uh, another African-American player to play professional football with the NFL at a very early stage. But if you look at the collegiate level, particularly in the South, you see all sorts of very troubling stories. Uh, one of them is uh, a man by the name of Greg Page, who arguably desegregated the Southeastern Conference when he was recruited by the University of Kentucky in 1967, an African-American. He comes to practice. Uh, one of the first practices, his teammates pile on him. He's paralyzed and he dies 38 days later in 1967, having arguably desegregated the Southeast Conference, but um, also paying for his life in doing so. Another very famous incident occurred in Stillwater, Oklahoma. At that time, it was Oklahoma A&M University, now Oklahoma State University. And the visiting team was the Drake University Bulldogs from Des Moines. And they had an African-American quarterback by the name of Johnny Bright, who the previous year in the NCAA led the whole conference, led the nation in, in, in rushing. It was an open secret on the Stillwater campus the week before, the week preceding the game between Drake and Oklahoma A&M that Johnny Bright would not last the entire game. Uh, the coach made all sorts of uh, racist comments to try to rev up his team in anticipation of this match. And during the first several plays of that game, after Johnny Bright had handed off the ball and was not part of the action any longer, a defensive lineman for Oklahoma and A&M by the name of Wilbank Smith crashed into him with his forearm and on the fourth blow broke his jaw and Johnny Bright, who had been a favorite for the Heisman Trophy that year, of course was uh, forced to leave the game and uh, was not the winner of the Heisman Trophy. So a lot of very sad stories, but eventually race was overcome in the desegregation of college football.
So uh, I included this from Harper's Weekly. This was uh, published in 1865, uh, coincident with the Civil War. Uh, this shows, I think, the, uh, the interlacing of football with uh, militarism. This is football being played in the uh, Civil, uh, Civil War Army camps, Union, Ar Union Army camps in, during the Civil War. Let's go on to hockey. Some say hockey is like religion, but that's wrong. Hockey is like faith. Uh, I had to work a lot on hockey, I have to say. It's not, not a game that I've taken to uh, earlier in my life, but uh, it's fascinating to see the, the progression of hockey. Hockey is a direct descendant of lacrosse, which of course is a Native American game. And the real origins in terms of its uh, adoption by Anglos, I suppose you'd say, would be uh, a man by the name of George Beers, who was a dentist in Montreal, Canada. And he used to go outside uh, Montreal and watch Native Americans playing lacrosse. And he had a great deal of admiration for the game, but he thought it was too chaotic. Uh, that is, there was no boundaries to the field. And according to him, he was almost certainly exaggerating. He said there were a thousand players on each team playing lacrosse. Now, I'm sure that's an exaggeration, but nevertheless, for him it was chaotic. Nevertheless, he saw that it had promise. George Beers was also a Presbyterian. And you know the tagline for Presbyterians? Anyone know? Everything has to be done decently and in order. Right. So he proceeded to impose order on this chaotic game of lacrosse. He formed the National Lacrosse Association. He said, this game needs boundaries. You have to have a bounded field and you have to limit the number of players on the field, I'm imposing all these rules on the game. And he also, and this was 1867, which of course is the, the year of the Canadian Confederation when Canada essentially became independent from uh, the United Kingdom. He said, this is going to be Canada's game. Canada needs its own game. Cricket won't do, it's too genteel, it's too, he didn't say prissy, but that's what he meant about it. Uh, and, and baseball is uh, the American game, the United States game. Canada needs its own game, a rough and tumble game that will replicate the Canadian frontier. And so he decides that lacrosse is going to be Canada's game in 1867, the same year as the Canadian Confederation. Ice hockey, evolves almost immediately from lacrosse after 1867. The first real game of ice hockey uh, played uh, indoors or underneath the canopy at the Victoria Skating Rink in Montreal took place in 1874. And then Canada then eventually, of course, uh, adopts lacrosse as its own game. And, uh, and it's still Canada's game in many ways. It was, it was threatened a bit by the Summit Series in 1972. Uh, I frankly didn't remember the Summit Series myself, but for Canadians, it's unmistakable. Uh, apparently, anybody who was you know, over five, six years old at the time, remembers where she or he was when Canada played the Summit Series in 1972. This was a game of Canadian professional hockey players against Soviet players who were amateurs at the time. And Canada went into this thinking, eh, no problem, this is our game, we'll be able to prevail very easily over the Soviets. Uh, it goes back and forth. Finally, there's an eighth game after ties. Of, uh, each team was, had a record of 3-3-1. Three, three, and one. And with only 34 seconds left to play, Paul Henderson for the Canadians scored a goal and Canada erupted in euphoria because once again, they claimed that hockey as their game. So. Hockey is Canada's game. Uh, here's a, the emblem of the National Lacrosse Association of Canada, 1867, which again, July 1st is the date of the Canadian Confederation, and it says, our country, our game. So we're gonna have our own identity with hockey. I think it continues also in a kind of religious frame with hockey night in Canada. 
Uh, anybody who's traveled to Canada during the winter months, during the hockey season, Saturday night is sort of a congregational call to worship when Canadians gather around their television sets to watch two games uh, featuring Canadian teams. This is a, a, a time of unity. This is the, a congregational gathering for Canadians where they reaffirm their commitment to the game of, of hockey. Let's go on to basketball. I love this quote from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. When it's played the way it's supposed to be played, basketball happens in the air, flying, floating, elevated above the floor, levitating, the way oppressed peoples of this earth imagine themselves in their dreams. The real origins of ice hockey are very much contested. That is to say, uh, if there's a a town in Canada east of, say, Toronto that does not claim to be the birthplace of hockey, I want to know about it because they all <laughs> claim to be. Kingston, uh, Dartmouth, Halifax, you know, all over the place. With basketball, however, there's very, very little mystery. And when the Toronto Raptors won the National Basketball Association Championship, it was the first time a Canadian team had won the NBA championship, but it also brought basketball very near to its real origins. The real origins are Springfield, Massachusetts, but a Canadian by the name of James Naismith, who was a graduate of McGill University, a Presbyterian minister, again, this decently and in order stuff plays into this as well. He was a student then at Springfield College, uh, it's now called Springfield College, back then it was called the YMCA Training School, so it was a YMCA school and his instructor challenged him to invent a new game to occupy young men between the football season and the baseball season. And so he came up with a game that eventually became basketball. The, actually, the name didn't really stick until a little bit later. And his, his idea was to play it on, in a, inside in a gymnasium using a soccer ball and a couple of peach baskets. So he went to the superintendent at the YMCA training school and I said, he said, I need a couple of, of uh, uh, actually cardboard boxes is what he was asking for. And the superintendent said, no, I don't have boxes, but I've got a couple of peach baskets. And that's how basketball uh, was developed. But basketball is in many ways, I think the quintessential urban game. That is to say, in the 1890s, this was a time when Americans were flocking to the cities in huge, huge numbers. Cities are growing exponentially at this time. And basketball, symbolically, I think, is an urban game because the object in basketball is to maneuver in a very constricted space without impeding the progress of others. Similar to walking down Fifth Avenue at lunch hour, right? <laughs> or Times Square in the evening, or if you're a Chicagoan, Michigan Avenue at, lunch, at rush hour. It's very difficult to do that, but that's the whole idea behind basketball. And basketball also imposed rules to make it more orderly. Uh, I actually ran across an account of a, an early basketball game where there were 50 5-0 players on each team <laughs> navigating a space roughly half the size of a conventional basketball court today. So you get a, an idea of the chaos. But that's one of the, the contributions of these sports is to provide order out of chaos. And that, I think, is one of the reasons that they, these sports are at attractive. It's also a place for integration. Uh, one of the key moments in the emergence of basketball as a, an integrated sport was a game in 1948 where the Harlem Globetrotters, of course, all-black all team, challenged the Minneapolis Lakers, the champions of the NBA, to an exhibition game, and the Globetrotters won. Um, the Minneapolis Lakers at that time featured George Mikan, one of the stellar players in the history of the NBA, uh, but uh, he lost, he and his team lost to the Harlem Globetrotters. It was the largest attended event at the Chicago Stadium up to that time, and that helped to persuade the NBA to integrate the, the league. And uh, within two years, African Americans were being drafted into the National Basketball Association. 
So conclusion here. What have I said? I forgot here. Okay, being a sports fan is a complex matter, in part irrational, but not unworthy. A relief from the seriousness of the real world with its unending pressures and often grave obligations. And I want to expand on that for a moment because I think one of the reasons that there's been such a sh surge of popularity for athletics and f athletic fandom is because the world of athletics offers an alternate universe. And I think this is especially attractive for white males, the de demographic of white males, because many of them perceive the world, and I want to underscore perceive, <laughs> perceive the world as being unfair, that they are somehow disadvantaged, that somebody else is getting a leg up on them and they can't succeed for various reasons because of preferential treatment in the outside world. The world of athletics offers an alternate universe. It's a world of precise angles, very often right angles, and geometricality, I think, is very important. Something is either inbounds or it's out of bounds. It's either fair or it's foul. I like to say that uh, if the batter takes strike three, he can't turn back to the ump and say, gee, um, I've had a bad day. <laughs> I didn't sleep very well last night. My sister's just been diagnosed with cancer. Give me a break. I need another strike. You don't do that in the world of sports. And I think that's one of the reasons that many people, and again, particularly white males, find this an attractive world. Uh, it's an orderly universe, very much in contrast to their perception, again, perception of the larger world. The world of athletics also offers, I think, the proverbial level playing field, particularly at the collegiate and professional levels. Mm -hmm. If you're not qualified, if you're not talented, you're not going to play. Now, uh, we have to acknowledge that issues of socioeconomic standing, gender and race also play into whether or not you're allowed to compete on that playing field. But I think athletics is, or sports generally, it's probably the closest thing we have in our society to a perfect meritocracy. Again, it's not perfect, but it's the closest thing we have to a meritocracy, and I think that's part of the reason that it's uh, so attractive. I want to play with another idea here. If I have, do I have time here? I guess I've got a couple of minutes, okay. Uh, this, I mentioned sports radio earlier, and this is Mike Francesa. Uh, some of you, if you've listened to sports radio here in, in New York, you've, you've heard his name or heard his voice. Uh, Sports radio is a kind of confessional. Uh, this struck me when I first started listening to it in the 1990s here in New York. That is, uh, especially in the early years of sports radio, someone would call in and say, hi Mike, hi Mike, first time, long time, meaning first time caller, long time listener. So it was kind of a ritual incantation. And then they would go into their uh, banter, their exchange about uh, their views of sports on, or whatever it might be. It strikes me it's not all that different from a confessional where the supplicant goes to the confessional and says, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been six months since my last confession. And then the interaction, the exchange goes on between the two. This also has another resonance for hockey. In the early years of hockey, transgressions on the ice, that is fouls or most often fighting, were dealt with by the referees essentially giving a parking ticket to the player and he would have to pay a fine or something like that. That's how things were, were, were handled. In the early 1930s, however, the penalty box was introduced to hockey and it came at the same time that Irish Canadians and French Canadians were beginning to play the game in large numbers. So Irish Canadians and French Canadians, overwhelmingly Catholic, you have the introduction of the penalty box where you go to atone for your sins. And you do so in a combination of Catholic and Protestant deterrence. Catholic deterrence in that you're set aside uh, and, 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 and made to be uh, penitent, uh, paying for your sins. 
Protestant in the way that the Puritans used to have uh, deviants uh, in stocks in the, in, the, uh, in the village green as a shaming mechanism. So the penalty box incorporates both of those uh, as well. But it seems to me that sports radio in many ways is sort of a confessional. Uh, and now finally, you probably heard this uh, story, uh, Fox personality, Laura Ingram uh, was commenting on some comments that LeBron James and Kevin Durant had made about uh, Black Lives Matter. And she was criticizing their comments and saying, in effect, shut up and dribble. Well, I mean, she did, she did say shut up and dribble. At the same time, or shortly thereafter, she talked about Drew Brees the white quarterback for the New Orleans Saints at the time, since retired, and his criticism of players who kneeled during the national anthem. And she said about Drew Brees, he's an individual, he's a human being, he has a right to his opinions. Whereas for the black athletes, shut up and dribble. And it seems to me that this is sadly playing out in the world of sports these days. That is, you have people like Colin Kaepernick, who has essentially has lost his career uh, because of his stand against racial intolerance and, and police brutality. And you, at the same time, you have this odd situation where an overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly white fan base cheers for athletes of color. But if they dare to express themselves outside of the arena, outside of the football field, outside of the hockey rink, then they are excoriated and castigated. It's the classic line about staying in your lane. Unless you stay in your lane, uh, if, as long as you stay in your lane, then we'll, you're, it's fine, we'll cheer for you. But if you step out of your lane, as Colin Kaepernick did, as LeBron James did, and other athletes, then you are uh, excoriated, it seems to me. Uh, and also it also strikes me, and I say this again with a great deal of sadness, it used to be in our society that we looked to religious leaders for moral guidance. Walter Rauschenbusch, Reinhold Niebuhr, Abraham Joshua Heschel, Dorothy Day, Martin Luther King, Thomas Merton. Where's that guidance coming from these days? How about Colin Kaepernick as one example? Uh, how about the world of athletics more generally? In many ways, they are talking to us about morality in a way that religious people no longer are. I think I'll leave it there. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Balmer. We have a few minutes for questions. If you're here in the room, my colleague Bailey Regan has question cards. She'll come around and, and pass them around and then, and then hand them to me. If you're online, you can submit your questions on YouTube or on Facebook, or you can email me, pthompson at stbarts.org, p-t-h-o-m-p-s-o-n at s-t-b-a-r-t-s dot org. We have a question already. Someone was wondering about the fact that you didn't mention soccer. <laughs> and is that perhaps um, because it's not militaristic enough and didn't catch on here? And I think, I think with that, um, you know, you've, you've talked about religion, uh, about athletics displacing religion. Um, a lot of clergy have come to notice that Sunday mornings yep. people are playing sports, often soccer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's seems to be part of the story about religion and sports. It, it does, now. and I, I use an example in the book, in the book of uh, a church, an evangelical church outside of Seattle, Washington, called East Lake Community Church, and they uh, typically would have their Sunday morning service at 10 o'clock, which is not unusual, of course. But the problem was that when the Seahawks were playing the New York Giants, I always want to say the New Jersey Giants, but that's probably not fair. The New York Giants or the Buffalo Bills or even the Cleveland Browns, game time in the East Coast was one o'clock. That's 10 o'clock Pacific time. And they quickly realized they couldn't compete. Uh, 
So what did they do? They canceled their Sunday morning service and rescheduled it for five o'clock in the afternoon after the games were over. And that gives you a sense of where the priorities are these days. Soccer. Uh, I thought about including soccer. I probably don't understand it well enough to, to be, to, to offer a critical perspective on it. But one of the things that's striking me, to me about these games in the modern world, particularly with the Industrial Revolution, is that they really move from being mob games to being more regulated uh, contests. And that, and we I talked about that already with lacrosse, for example, as, 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 as a very good example of that. I guess I consider soccer still somewhat a mob game, and I don't mean that <laughs> critically. And I, ju I just don't see the sort of intricate symbolism uh, in, in soccer that uh, I see in the other games. I mean, the interesting thing about soccer um, proportionally to the other sports is that it's participatory exactly. in the U.S. as yeah. opposed to we're not quite as focused on being fans, we're actually playing the sport. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, part of this story is gender, yeah. um, and you yeah. haven't talked much, if at all, about women's sports. Apparently, I, I haven't had a chance to read the New York Times today, but there's a spot about sports being patriarchal oppression in the New York Times <laughs> today. Um, I didn't write that one. What's interesting <laughs> about religion and sports is, is these are two spaces in contemporary life where it still seems acceptable to segregate across yeah. the lines no, of, of right. gender yeah. um, and wonder if there's a connection there. I think, I think that's right, and I think that's one of the reasons it's, a, it's appealing to, to white males in particular. Is it's, it's a masculine world in many ways. And even think about the role that women play in these sports. They are relegated literally to the sidelines. Right, as cheerleaders, right, which is you know uh, fraught in all sorts of ways, but even in, in major league parks, uh, very often you have uh, ball girls who uh, who fetch foul balls and, and take them out of play and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think it is it is a masculine world, and I think that's part of the part of the attraction. I'm not endorsing that or saying that's a good thing, but I think that's 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 part of the appeal. Now, having said that, women certainly have made major strides in sports, uh, particularly after Title IX, which is now 50 years old. Uh, but I, one of the things I do is, is look at uh, the, w, uh, the NBA and the WNBA, because that's the only professional league, uh, professional sports where you have a women's analog. And if you look at it, the statistics in terms of salary, attendance, TV viewership, I mean, it's just, it's just massively out of whack. And, and, and women have come a long way. They still have a long way to go. What are the explanations for that disparity? With WNBA, well, I think one of the things is that the WNBA is more recently, a more recent uh, league. Uh, I think there's probably a perception on the part of many people that uh, the, the NBA game is probably more fun to watch in some ways uh, with the athleticism. You also have the, the cultivation of stars. Uh, the WNBA is just starting to get into that a little bit, but you know, people like Michael Jordan or uh, LeBron James or Kobe Bryant, I think, were cultivated by the league to be you know, kind of the face of the league in many ways. And you don't quite have that yet with the WNBA. It's coming, though, I think. I hope so. So, someone wonders if you had anything to do with the recent 27-24 Dartmouth win over Columbia <laughs> with eight seconds left. <laughs> no, I have a, I, I teach a course, and actually I'm teaching this quarter called Sports, Ethics, and Religion. And uh, I have, actually, I designed the course actually because I wanted athletes to, to have a place to, to be immersed in the humanities. And so uh, the, the football coach always has his football team members in the front row. And uh, every Tuesday, the first day of the week when we meet for class, I ask students to talk about their sports teams, what happened over the weekend. And, Tuesday I'll be talking. They haven't talked at all yet this <laughs> this year because they've been losing their games, but apparently they pulled one out against Columbia. Sorry. <laughs> A question about tribalism, yeah. um, something that folks are, um, we're increasingly recognizing as part of our national yeah. political life. Um, apparently there was a story someone mentions in, the, in, in NPR recently about how the fact that people can cross racial lines while wearing the same color yeah. for a team. Um, so there's... Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good point. And uh, I have a friend back in Hanover who says, 
uh, who, who commented one day, he said, if I'm filling my, my car with gas at the, at the station, at the gas station, and a pickup truck comes alongside me with a New England Patriots bumper sticker, sorry, with this New England, I don't mean to be disloyal to New York fans here. Uh, he said, you know, all of a sudden we have something to talk about. We may, we may be different socioeconomically, probably different politically, but we have a, a bond and we can talk. And you know, I think that's probably a good thing. We need maybe more of that <laughs> these days in, a, in our society. To the extent that religion, that athletics has replaced religion or at least displaced it somewhat, um, what can religion, what can the church learn from the success of sports? What, what, what can we do because sports has proved that it's a, it's a good strategy? Wow. Oh, Peter. <laughs> um, I, I don't, uh, I mean, well, there have been adaptations like this church in Washington. You know, a lot of churches now have Super Bowl parties and that sort of thing, but and that's not going to that's not going to change anything uh, over the long term. I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I, I, you know, I, I, mean, I come out of evangelicalism, and so one of the things that we used to do is, you know, for Sunday school, I have the red team and the blue team, or the you know yellow team, whatever, and and you know compete with one another for bringing in new people and memorizing Bible verses and things like that. I, I guess I have some doubts that St. Bart's is gonna <laughs> move the needle on, on the red and, red and green teams. But I, 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 I wish I had a better answer for you or had any answer for you, Peter. I'm not sure I do. I mean, what's interesting is that St. Bart's in building this building, our third building, was influenced by muscular Christianity. There's a basketball court yes, in the basement. Exactly. There's a swimming pool. Yep. Um, there was this sense that, you know, that athletics yes. was the church's realm. And, and even in the South today, you can go to places. A great uncle of mine was a um, Southern Baptist minister and was minister of athletics. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> there are all these church-sponsored teams sure. that there's been yeah. an intentional blending no, of the athletic right. and religious worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, early in the 19th, uh, early in the 20th century, there was something called the Institutional Church Movement, which would have been this would have been mm -hmm. part of that. Riverside would be another example of that. Bowling alleys, for example, as well as basketball courts, and and again, even the Catholics get into the, to the mix with the uh, CYO the Catholic Youth Organization, boxing tournaments and basketball leagues and, and that sort of thing. So yes, maybe that's the answer is turn this into a basketball court, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one final question, not, not an easy one either, um, but asking about, um, you're, you're talking about the, aggressive, uh, the aggression in American sports yeah. and militarization and what does that say about kind of America as a military superpower as well as issues like uh, gun control and gun violence. Um. I, I think there's no question we're a violent society. And I think that's one of the reasons that football is so popular here in, in America, is that we, we, um, we extol violence in many ways, I think. And uh, even if we don't want to admit it, I don't want to admit it. I watch football and I don't want to admit that I'm really participating in something that is really quite violent and, and quite destructive. Um, some time ago, when I was doing a documentary for, for PBS, I was working with a British director, and so he spent a lot of time here because we were working together. And he, uh, at that time, was thinking about coming to, to the United States, moving to the United States. And after several months, he said, I just can't do it. It's, it's, this is too violent a society. I can't be part of that. So I think that's part of the reason that we we love football is we we love the violence and even hockey right you know that's uh, you know, people watch hockey a lot of them for for the violent eruptions in the game and what that says about us I think is probably not all that complimentary <laughs> and I think we have to come to terms with that so that we end on a positive note oh. what what is holy and wonderful about the American fascination with sports well I think what uh, I, I, that's a great question because I think sports, like religion, offers us moments of transcendence. That is to say, to watch a gifted athlete performing his or her craft, it really is quite I find it quite uplifting. Uh, you know, I'm showing my age here, but Michael Jordan, when Michael Jordan was at his, his, in his prime, I mean, he would just you know, talk about defying gravity. I mean, it was just poetic the way he, he would uh, perform. 
and, and, and do so with such, such grace. I, I think that's the, the real beauty of sports. And uh, as a sports fan, that's what I appreciate as well. Well, Professor Ballmer, thank you for being with us this morning. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Balmer will be staying with us for the 11 a.m. service and preaching at it. Um, thankfully, one of the lectionary readings today was about running the long race, so it was a great uh, coincidence. <laughs> so we hope you'll stick around too, whether you're here in person or joining us online. And a reminder that Professor Balmer's books are in our bookstore, including the most recent Passion Plays, How Religion Shapes Sports in North America. Next week at the forum, we'll be talking about the Mexican tradition of Dia de los Muertos ahead of our second annual uh, celebration of Dia de los Muertos here. We'll be joined by Professor Claudio Lamnitz of Anthropology at Columbia. See you then.